are back on the Zero Hour, and joining us once again is Professor Richard Wolf. I always look forward to our conversations. I always learn so much and get such a good perspective. For those of you who haven't heard our conversations before, of course, Richard Wolf is an economist and economic historian. He is a professor at, well, a bunch of places, and he is also the host of uh, Economic Update on, um, on Free Speech TV an author of uh, a number of books, including his latest, The Sickness is the System. And there's so much we could talk about. But before we begin, first of all, of course, Richard Wolf, welcome back to the program. Thank you, RJ. Glad to be here. And we're delighted to have you. I guess uh, I posed a rather rhetorical question recently on Twitter. I was looking at uh, inflation-adjusted hourly earnings for American workers, and it appears to me that uh, the working people of this country, the people who earn hourly wages, have, uh, despite the fact that we're always being told that we we live in a growth economy and uh, and uh, that sort of thing, that working people, hourly wage earners, have actually lost income since, oh, about 1980 or so. So the question I posed was, who could possibly look at these declining wages and conclude that what this economy needs is less demand? And my answer was the people who run the American economy can. Was I being unfair to the people who run the American economy? No, they've accumulated a record that would make it difficult even to imagine what unfairness might look like. Uh, the debt is so lopsidedly stacked against them by their own hand. Uh, let's take a little look at this. Um, 1980, you could actually go back into the 1970s and you would see a number that most commentators have been struggling with now uh, for, for the following reason. We're talking half a century. From 1972 to now is one half of a century. Basically across that century, the real wages, that is the amount of money we give to an average worker adjusted for what he or she has to pay when they spend that money on food, clothing, shelter, and so on. In other words, to understand the wage as the money and the affordability of the money you get, what you can buy with it, there's been no change. We, we have flatlined the American working class. And the important thing about that is that for the previous 100 to 150 years, that was not the case. This country raised the real wage. That is, whatever happened to prices, wages went up more than that so that worker could afford more. That's why we have in America things like the American dream or the notion of American exceptionalism. For 100, 150 years, capitalism in America gave more real income to the bulk of its working class. Not, of course, to African Americans, not particularly to women, but overwhelmingly to the white male population, it was a rising standard of living. That stopped in the early 1970s, and here comes the important point. It never resumed. In other words, it bounced around a little, as that Bureau of Labor Statistics graph will show you, but the, the long-term 50 years, nothing. Now, during those 50 years, the productivity of American workers went up every year, one to two percent. But, you know, over 50 years, we're then talking doubling, tripling, an enormous increase. Why do I tell you that? Because productivity measures, in effect, what the worker gives to the employer, just like the real wage measures what the employer gives to the worker. If what the employer gave to the worker is flat for 50 years, as we've just discussed it was, and as the data all show, but if what the worker gives the employer goes up steadily for 50 years, guess what? We become a vastly more unequal society because the rich who own the businesses, either 
directly or by buying shares of stock, they're picking up the growing gap between what the employer gives the worker and the growing output that the worker gives the employer. So there's your explanation for the inequality that is off the chart. You know, 50 years ago, the United States was less unequal than, say, Britain or France or Italy and so on. Now we are much more unequal than those societies. All of that is wrapped up uh, in these statistics. And the people who sit on top, the big businessmen and women, the politicians they own and buy, uh, we could talk about Uber last week, a stunningly wonderful example of all of that. Republicans and Democrats alike have been presiding for 50 years over this process. It hasn't made any difference. The rate of the gap growing between what is given to the uh, wealthy by the workers and what they don't get in return has gotten wider and wider, whether or not a uh, Republican or a Democrat was sitting in the White House or presiding in Congress. It really made no difference. So they're all culpable. And now to say, and, and I'm blown away, RJ, as much as you are, maybe more, to have the head of the Federal Reserve get up in his rich businessman outfit and stand there and talk about how we're going to deal with an, an inflation, which, by the way, is why the number is terrible these days, because workers' wages are rising at roughly half the rate of our prices, and therefore workers are falling behind. But to stand there and to say, we're going to deal with this inflation, which, by the way, reflects that the Federal Reserve hasn't been able to do its job because its job written in its charter is to maintain price stability. Hello, inflation means you didn't do that. Stable is not an inflation. So to stand there and to say, we're going to deal with this inflation. By the way, he's been saying that for the entire last year. And to date, no sign of it. But to say it, and he's going to raise interest rates because that will bring down demand. Whoa. Who gets hurt by an inflation? Who gets hurt when you raise the price of something? Who gets hurt when you raise the interest rate on borrowed money? The answer is the poor. That's all markets allocate whatever is scarce based on how much money you have. That's what a market does. It bids up the price of whatever is scarce, and then only the rich can afford it. So you're solving a problem based on 50 years of redistributing income from the bottom and the middle to the top by doing more of the same, by choosing policies that are more costly to the poor and the middle than they are to the rich. The rich person doesn't care if the price of milk doubles. It makes no difference. But for a poor or middle income family with children, it makes a big difference. What are you doing acting as though we were all in the boat together and we're going to constrain demand by re What are you talking about? You are using a language carefully edited so that no one understands the discrimination against the vast majority of the people that's going in on here. When Mr. Powell talks, he is disrespecting, he is hurting, he is discriminating against the working class majority. It's as if he got up there and announced an interesting new social program. However, unfortunately, this will not be uh, available to black people or brown people or female people. You know, we would sit there staring at the sheer gall of an official talking like that. But here we have the same thing, but we have a mainstream media that nods along as if there was something reasonable, normal, routine. It isn't. It is 
the very thing that is splitting and ripping this society apart is being enacted by people who do not figure it out or they don't care or in my experience they don't figure it out because they don't care and then the two sides reinforce each other and they become the Bidens, the Trumps, the Powells of our society. Well, this may be a frivolous thought given the horror of this situation, but I do wonder, I can't help but wonder whether the public react, the media reaction would have been any different if Powell had had the honesty to say what we think we should do and what we intend to do in response to this inflation is make everything way more expensive. Instead of using language like reducing demand, it just said, we're going to make everything more expensive and it's going to be harder for you to afford. Just because that's the net effect. What if, he, what if he just said that? Milk is going to be more expensive. Rent's going to be more expensive. Fuel is going to be more expensive. Uh, I wonder if the media would have deigned to tell the story if he had said that. Well, I think had he done so, here's how it would have been done. And my guess is, and I say this partly out of knowing some people in these places, because they were friends of mine when we all got our PhDs in economics. Um, had they gone that route and there were people advocating it, it would have it would have gone like this. Uh, the inflation should be understood as a kind of cure. Uh, in other words, it's like advocating herd resolution for COVID. We just have to face the fact that X million people are going to be dead. And that's the way this works. And the dead ones are the vulnerable ones, the, the ones that had uh, prior conditions and all the rest. And we are going to be a stronger, healthier people when we've culled the herd. You know, th th that kind of quasi-Nazi type of uh, problem solving, that they would have come in with that. And they would have added, so that they don't get blamed, that all of it is due to Mr. Putin. And that somehow the war in Ukraine, it, well, look, they're doing it with energy. They're doing it with food. They've already made that case along the way. They haven't made it the prime case. But they've admitted they're going to be working on the inflation. That's why this last week there were wringing of hands and how disappointed they were that the inflation numbers got worse, not better. So they're, they're doing the theater, if you like, blaming somebody else. That's a good one. Explaining how the inflation is a problem for all of us. No, it isn't. It's a problem for people who aren't rich. For people who are rich, it's virtually pointless. It's not an issue. They have diversified their assets. They have instructed their stockbrokers to put their money in a safe place. They've done all of that. And if they hadn't done it six months ago, well, then they did it three weeks ago. It doesn't really matter for them. But for everybody else, there's no recourse. There's no way uh, out of this. The business community, which might have responded by raising wages more so that the average person could cope with the inflation, have done nothing of the sort. Instead, they tell a fantastical story about a labor shortage, because that they want people to realize, we don't have enough people coming to work. That's a translation of the following sentence. We don't offer people enough money to have them come to work, and so they're not coming, and it's entirely their fault. We are simply spectators of this. I mean, really, you have to put on your head the fakery of, of the last 50 years when you watch with, as people with a straight face tell you things that are horrible as if they were normal, routine, unremarkable uh Here's a final point on this, RJ, because it's so important. This is simple economics. If you inject money into the economy, if you're a, a policymaker like Mr. Powell at the Federal Reserve, you justify it by saying, uh, we're pumping money into the economy to create more demand, 
uh, to make money available, and to that will mean more purchases, and that will mean jobs. You see, we are solving an unemployment problem by pumping money in. They've been saying that for the last 25 years. Okay, every student of economics knows if there's more money in the community, every businessman or woman, every employer has a choice to make. You can respond to increasing money in the pockets of your potential customers, either by ordering more stuff to sell to them for the extra money they have, or by jacking up the price of what you already have. We allow enterprises the freedom to make that choice, which is why pumping money into the economy can either solve the problem of unemployment if businesses choose that way, or they can do nothing about unemployment, but give us not only the unemployment, but inflation to boot as all the uh, employers jack up their prices. We call that stagflation. We have that all the time. Now the reverse, inflation. You wanna stop an inflation, you pull money out of the economy. That's what the Fed is doing now. That's what raising interest rates is designed to do. Dissuade potential borrowers from borrowing because you've jacked up the interest rate. Okay, now we have the reverse. All businesses now know there's less money in the economy. There's money being taken out of the economy by the Federal Reserve. We have a choice to make. Do we respond to the less purchasing power by calling up our supplier and saying, hey, don't sell us anything, because don't deliver because we can't sell, uh, or do we bring down the price in order to deal with the fact that we don't have enough customers? The private enterprises can and often have and may very well now choose with free enterprise to say, Oh, there's less money in the economy. I know what that means for middle income and poor people. They can't afford what I produce and what I sell. Rich people can. So I'm going to raise the price, sell to the rich, and screw everybody else. They're free to do that, in which case the Federal Reserve will experience in the months to come what it just experienced in the month of June, which is despite its efforts, the inflation gets worse, not better, because free enterprises are using their freedom to do what they think is in their best interests, and the rest of us are screwed. Every economist knows this. Therefore, a policy of increasing and decreasing money all by itself guarantees exactly nothing. May work, may not work. To use it without explaining that, to use it without telling the people what else could be done. You want to make this system work? Here's what you do. You declare a wage price freeze right now, and you cut the amount of money in the economy right now. Those two things together mean that every business will not be able to frustrate the goals of policy by raising prices anymore. And then you'll get the effect. I mean, it's just, it's mind-bending what is being done and the language developed by the way over generations i don't want to blame the, mr powell is in no way unique he's he's typical he's nothing on, on you but it's a language that already has in it it's like reading the declaration of independence we hold these truths to be self-evident all men are created equal written by white property gentlemen who were at the time, if I have my history right, less than 10% of the population. We hold all men to be, no, you don't. Right. You are saying something which is lovely, but has no relationship to the reality, and you know it, but you're so lost in your ideological bubble, you need to talk as though the world were other than you know it to be. So, you're, uh, Richard Wolf, you're describing an economic idiom. I mean, the phrase that comes to mind is the banality of evil. That it, there is a kind of 
banal language. For example, you know, as you may or may not know, a lot of what I do is involved with social security, analyzing social insurance issues, advocacy in that area. There are a lot of people right now saying, well, any expansion of social security and related Medicare and so on, this would be inflationary. And uh, you, know, you use the analogy of, you know, thinning the herd, culling the herd, you know, like, I don't know, a cheetah taking down a sickly Gemsbach or something. But we're talking in many cases about elderly people who can't afford fuel oil and could freeze to death, right? And we're talking about this in this banal, abstract way, as if it's perfectly normal to be, you know, weighing the pros and cons of, well, it seems to me this would have an inflationary effect that would be deleterious to the overall state, state of the economy. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? You're killing some poor old widow, you know. Isn't that what you're saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that is what I am saying. It is a, uh, you know, when, uh, when, I, when I encounter it, as I do kind of all the time, it, after a while, it is the banality of you. You realize that people have, in, their, by using this language, insulated themselves from the effect, become literally self-blind. When, when the United States urges, and I, I don't mind using it even if it provokes some people, but it, it, when the United States uses its good offices to encourage Mr. Zelensky in his comedian's fantasy about war with Russia, uh, and then spends 60 to $100 billion, we don't actually know how much, but it's in that range. Um, and nobody in power says, this is inflationary. Right. This is, this is an inflation. What are we doing? And it, and then in the ensuing months, the price of food and the price of gas and the price of oil and the price of energy and everything explodes literally to demonstrate empirically that the notion that it would be inflationary has now been demonstrated. Still, we are going to cut Social security on the grounds of its potential inflationary impact. Having such a discussion is, is a conversation with a lunatic. You're having a you're going through arguments, only after a little while you look into the eyes of the person you're speaking with and you're realizing that you're having an intense conversation with cement, you know, or a tree. <laughs> this person is, is gone. He, he or she is in another place that they feel safe in. I understand that. But the discourse is no longer uh, relevant because they've, they've checked out. They, they are not, they're in another place. Their morality is exhausted by however they construct the war in Ukraine. That's the end of that. And no discussion, no question, nothing is possible. We're done. And it is a, a kind of mentality that usually goes with people in an extreme situation. And I look around the United States and I say to myself, well, what's the extreme situation here that would make otherwise decent, good human beings clam up like this? you know, lose their their ability to think. And that's where I get reinforced that in my idea that among the things that are happening below the surface is not just what you and I talk about, but a, a tearing apart of a community that is frightening more and more people and they don't know quite where to turn. And so they hunker down in their church or their ethnicity, or their whatever, and they're no longer thinking, they're protecting themselves from a disintegration that frightens them, but doesn't help them understand what it's about. And I also think it's always important in these conversations, Richard Wolf, to talk about what could be, 
what might have been and what could be, right? So, you know, if we go back to 1970, let's say, you know, whatever, post-war, 48 to 68, whatever period you want to pick, obviously, you know, growth, Imperfect, as you say, because, you know, uh, excluding minority groups, excluding women and so on. But you still had a large segment of the working population um, whose prosperity was increasing. You had people like my family when I was a child, modest, very modest home, finally able to buy a car when I was a kid, buy a TV when I was eight or nine, you know, getting there, right? Make, getting somewhere. And um, on one one income and uh, somewhere along the line, uh, equal rights for women got mixed up and both parents have got to work just to survive. Right. So and, and so now you got two people working. Think about uh, I mean, I, I know you have, but. I would love everybody to think about what might have been if if employers had continued to share uh, increased productivity with working people. Maybe both parents could work half time. Maybe the father and mother could alternate years off. Maybe you know all sorts of alternative arrangements could have developed in the last 50 years. You get what I'm driving at, right? Absolutely. No, and I agree with you 100% that all of those things were possible. All of those things. A labor movement could have arisen, which said, by the way, there are European labor movements who made these uh, demands explicit, the one I'm about to say, which is, you know, we're the working class. And if there's productivity growth in this country, it has to be shared with the working class. That's it. It's not a discussion. It's not a proposal. That's a demand. You know, it's a demand. It's like saying, you cannot employ a child under the age of uh, 17 or whatever uh, you know year you pick because that stunts the child's development, that impedes the learning process, it messes up schooling. Uh, so it's out. It, you know, before child labor was outlawed in this country, it was the norm. Corporations hired children as young as five and six. It was all over the place. And yet the mass of people led by the labor movement put an end to it. The corporation said it'll destroy capitalism. We can't make a profit. It's bad for poor families that they can't send their kids out to bring in a little more money. All of that crap was used. It all failed. But it's the exact same issue as saying men and women equality requires that productivity be shared with the family so that men and women can equally distribute or at least have their own say in distributing the labor of childcare, the labor of household maintenance in a balance. That's what's called in Europe, by the way, in a work life balance that constrains both the job employer on the one hand and the working class family on the other. All of those things were possible then. They're all possible now. It's only a question of whether the political mentality and the organization of the working class. We are the majority. We are the overwhelming majority. If you put being the majority together with organization, there is no limit to what you could accomplish. You know what I've been doing lately, and then I'll, I'll give you the last word. And by lately, I mean the last several years since my sense of time has changed. I've been reading everything from 19th century labor history to the English civil wars, all of them, you know, to uh, everything I can on periods of revolutionary change, because I feel as if we've, I, I just feel as if I've got to tap into all the times in human history when we've re-examined the assumptions that seem to be permanent and static and and altered them forever, whether it was how we divided and shared the land to how we accounted for our labor, whether it was, you know, the Luddites or anybody else uh, to, um, you know, the uh, diggers or anybody. I just feel as if inspiration has to come from uh, all sorts of places if we're going to re-examine re our assumptions today. But I'll, I'll give you the last 
best word. Well, I think what's happening to you with your interests at this point in your life is less about you and about aging and any of the rest of it that we're all going through. But I think you're responding to what's happening in the environment around you, as we always do, more or less. And I, uh, I don't mind saying out loud, I'm saying it more and more, because it's the truth that keeps coming at me. Um, every empire, every system was in the past was born, evolved over time, and then died and passed away. There is absolutely no reason to imagine that capitalism is exempt from that. Once upon a time, capitalism in America was concentrated in New England. It's gone. It left. New England is left as a place of universities, of tourism, of medical research. It has gone on, but it isn't the place where capital accumulates. It went to the Midwest. And it developed the Midwest and Detroit and Chicago became the center. And they're not anymore. Detroit is a disaster uh, in terms of capitalism. It moved on. Well, it doesn't just do that within the country. It doesn't just go from one part of the country to another. It left parts of the United States, but it also left the United States. And it left Western Europe. England is becoming a place that it once was, a cold, wet, offshore island of the continent of Europe. Uh, and it will be famous for other things that the British people will create, but it won't be the capitalist center of the world. They haven't been that for a century. They still can't get their heads around the fact that they're not that anymore. Meanwhile, the United States empire has risen, peaked, and here comes the sad part, is now going down, and it is terrifying the American people. It is part of why denial is so much a part of how we handle even small crises, even small difficulties. They are all cataclysmic, just like our movies are all about tsunami right. and the death-dealing death uh, water movements and cloud bursts and monsters. And we're frightened. And we're frightened for a perfectly reasonable reason. But you can go down with the empire in a way that's creative and interesting and finding new ways. Or you can be miserable, unhappy, flail around and make the whole thing catastrophic. That's where we are. And I think as we rip our society apart, because it cannot deal with the reality, and so jumps around ersatz uh, movements and issues, because it can't face what's really there, we are, people like us are being asked a question by the world we live in. Is it still possible to save this thing? Or are we in a, in a condition where we have to make a revolution because nothing else is available to change the direction of a society that seems hell-bent on, you know, look at us. We, we produce Trump. They produce Bor Boris Johnson, or as he is now called, Boorish Johnson. You know, he's gone. Uh, and these were clownish, desperate people play-acting at a history they didn't understand at all. Uh, and what, what have they taught us? It's an extraordinary moment. And all bets are off, all the norms, all the assumptions. That's why people were surprised that the Supreme Court cancels abortion, celebrates a, a, a football coach praying on the 50-yard line of a public school, or gives the police more power. They want to go backwards because they're terrified about where things are going and so, as happens so often, they romanticize a good old days and rush as fast as they can, thereby tearing the social community further apart, you know, as the ball bounces to ever more extremes. They don't know what to do. They follow these instincts, makes the problem worse. Very sad to watch. Very sad to watch. But as I always say, we're honored by history because we live in times where what we do really matters. So 
with that thought, Richard Wolf, as always, very rewarding to speak with you. And I, I thank you for taking the time to talk with us. Thank you, RJ. I appreciate your program all the time. It, it's just amazing. I just wish it rubs off and makes other people courageous about these questions as well. Thank you. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour. <laughs>